Hello, everyone. My name is Sean Sublett. I will be one of your hosts for today's webinar from here at Climate Central in Princeton, New Jersey. And uh, we're very excited to have everybody along with us today. Joining me shortly will be our director and chief meteorologist, Bernadette woods Plackey. And we have people joining us today from many disciplines and from all across, uh, all across the globe, from the United States, from Alaska to Florida. Uh, so we want to thank everybody for joining us. Now, for those of you who have joined us for the first time, welcome. A little bit about who we are. Climate Central is a nonprofit organization dedicated to communicating the science and impacts of climate change to the public. Our series of webinars is part of our Climate Matters program, which provides multimedia and educational outreach to broadcast meteorologists across the country. This reminder for you meteorologists attending, that attending today's webinar, and of course by registering ahead of time, it counts as credit towards recertification of AMS, CBM, and NWA seals. You can find examples of our multimedia at our brand new searchable online library. You can see it there at the address on your screen, medialibrary.climatecentral.org. And today's webinar, will be archived along with our previous webinars. You can reach that through our media library link as well, or more directly at that longer address on your screen. So to talk about, and today, excuse me, to talk about the relationship between climate change and extreme weather, we're very excited to have Radley Horton join us from his office at Columbia University in New York City. Radley is a Lamont Associate Research Professor at Columbia's Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory. His research focuses on climate extremes, climate impacts, and adaptation. Radley was a convening lead author for the third National Climate Assessment. He's also the Columbia University lead for the Department of Interior funded Northeast Climate Science Center and is a PI on the NSF funded Climate Change Education Partnership Project. He serves on numerous national and international task force and committees, including the Climate Scenarios Task Force, in support of the 2018 National Climate Assessment. As a brief aside, we want to encourage questions for Radley at the end of the presentation. So please use the chat function on your Zoom platform at the bottom right, type in your questions, and we will get in as many as we can during our 60 minute time limit today. With that, Radley, you're still with us, sir? Radley, can you hear me? Sure, you're not muted on accident. These things happen. There you go, sir. I apologize for that. Can you hear me now, Riley? Yes. Can you hear me? I hear you just fine. Sometimes you know you have 40 different buttons to push, these things happen. So I'm going to stop sharing. This gives you the opportunity to share your screen. So go ahead and do so, sir, if you are ready. Okay. Let's see if that will work. Share screen. You're not seeing my screen yet, are you? Not just yet. Okay. So I'm getting a prompt that says host disabled attendee screen sharing. Well, that's odd. I'll make you the host. Let's see what happens. Okay, uh, so let's see here. Great, I think this is now gonna work. You can find my presentation in the midst here. Um, yeah, there we are. All right, we've got it over here, sir. Okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you everybody for, for patience during that. Um, really happy to have the chance to uh, speak with you today. Um, I am going to focus largely on uh, extreme weather events, a um, uh, key interest of mine uh, at Lamont Dowry. I think a lot about um, the key processes, um, what goes into, um, uh, you know, what are the ingredients that, that formulate these extreme events that have such big impacts on our society, um, and how might they change um, uh, as we increase greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere um, through our activities. During most of the talk today, um, 
I'm really going to focus on what we've observed to date, a sort of historical um, dimension to extreme weather events. Um, so there'll be you know a fair amount on some of the some of the time series, largely for the U.S. Um, of extreme weather events, but we'll also have some time to talk a little bit about things like um, what does the future look like? Uh, what are some of the limitations um, of what we can tell with climate models? Um, and, how, and some of the impacts and how we may, uh, may adapt. Okay, does everyone see, um, did the slides just advance? We look good from here, yes sir. Okay, great. Um, so, you know, as in any year, um, if we look at the global scale, we see a diverse set and diverse types of, of extreme weather events. Um, you know, some things that certainly jump out at us and are fresh in, in so many of your memories, I know. Um, the hurricane season um, over the Atlantic last year. Reminders here of Harvey, Irma, and Maria, um, uh, which by some estimates, if I remember right, may have caused on the order of 300 billion um, in damages, not to mention the, you know, the hugely significant loss of life. Um, so that's the context, um, you know, as we think about, about extreme weather events. They're diverse um, in their type. They impact the entire globe. Um, and by many indications, their costs are going up, um, presumably partly due to, you know, changes in, in human vulnerability, human population. Um, but we're also going to try to unpack um, uh, climate signals uh, as well uh, within these, these extreme events. So what are some of the characteristics of extreme weather events? Um, well, they really are diverse, as you can see here. Um, in terms of uh, time duration and spatial scale, um, depending on what type of events we're, we're talking about, this could be a microburst, you know, a really high resolution uh, rainstorm, the kind of thing that, that, that develops uh, and persists maybe over a few minutes at very fine spatial scales. We can also, of course, think about extreme events as multi-year phenomena in some case, you know, really severe droughts such as California has, has experienced um, and events that may have spatial scales, you know, the size of, of the U.S. Or, or half the U.S. So they're, so they're very diverse. Um, pretty much any definition that you'd have of an extreme event, um, you know, would start from the assumption that it's at least somewhat rare. Um, you know, is it something that happens once every several years in a given place? Or is it, you know, days above 90 degrees Fahrenheit, which for some places might happen as often as you know, 30 or more days per year. There's, you know, a range, um, but to some extent, um, uh, extreme events are rare, which, as we'll see, poses challenges when we when we start start to look at at trends and what may be behind those trends. Um, they're often multivariate, right? I mentioned the example of a drought uh, before, but what exactly is a drought? I mean, most most superficially, it's an absence of precipitation, right? That's how we're we're used to thinking about it. But of course, we know that the higher the temperatures are, um, the easier it tends to be for soil moisture or vegetation to dry out, right? So really we need to include consideration of temperature in any definition of drought. And then what about things like, um, you know, how much water people are actually using? That's a dimension of drought too. So, um, so once we really start to unpack what an extreme event is, this, this multivariate nature um, can make it challenging. And, and there can be many causes that, that, that in many cases go beyond um, the meteorology um, and climate aspects that we're going to be talking about. Okay, next slide, you know, really, really obvious, but I think, um, you know, an important reminder. And given what I, you know, my understanding is that a lot of you do on a daily basis, I know that um, this speaks very close to, to, to your experience and, and, and people you know. Obviously, extreme events have disproportionate impacts on the things we, things we care about, whether it's Hurricane Sandy, um, extreme heat events, um, people are vulnerable, our ecosystems are vulnerable, um, our infrastructure isn't, isn't always uh, developed to withstand these kind of extremes. Um, which leads to damages, um, also the, you know, the inability for, 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 for certain missions and responsibilities to, to, to be met. Um, other reasons we want to study extreme events, um, you know, that learning more can improve our decision making, right? If we, can, if we can sort of delve in and think about utility grids, what are the temperature thresholds that are particularly important for, you know, increasing the odds of, of power failures, for example, if we, if we can 
study extreme events in a more deep way um, and, and link that to, to the knowledge of decision makers, um, there is really the potential to, um, you, you know, that's one ingredient to, to improving a broad set of, of decisions. And then I think it's important to be honest, you know, um, from a scientific perspective, from a personal perspective, that these incredibly dangerous and often tragic events uh, do have a certain draw. You know, that's 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 part of the story for some people more more than others. And um, there are are opportunities um, uh, to engage the public and engage communities in, in, in thinking about these these kind of extreme events. And certainly they present challenges, but also opportunities from uh, science policy and communication perspectives whether it's a public that's, you know, sort of open to thinking about their vulnerabilities to extreme events after they hit, to leveraging, you know, people's willingness to sort of collaborate and, and, and help each other after certain types of extremes, to maybe opportunities to rebuild in different ways after catastrophic events and, and you know, leverage funding opportunities to, uh, to increase our resilience. These are all things that can be thought of, you know, particularly but not exclusively through the lens of, of extreme events. Okay, so as Sean, you know, graciously mentioned, I've had the good fortune to contribute to um, National Climate Assessment um, uh, the third time around, and then this Climate Science Special Report was essentially part part one of the fourth, fourth National Climate um, Assessment. So a lot of what I'm going to show you today um, is historical trends um, in different types of extremes over the U.S. Um, that were produced by the by the diverse um, and rich author team um, um, as part of this climate science special report. So before we get into those specifics of extreme weather events um, and their trends, you know, I wanted to highlight uh, this one little statement that in a way captures um, so much uh, of what's in this, you know, 600 page or more report. So uh, climate change is real. Um, human activities are playing a critical role. Um, it's serious. This is something that, um, you know, impacts all of us and it impacts all of us today. This isn't just a, a distant issue. Um, and we'll circle back towards the end to talk about um, the fact that the window of time um, is starting to close to, pr to prevent some of the, some of the most serious impacts uh, of a changing climate. Some, but not all of which, are gonna manifest themselves through changes in the statistics, the frequency, intensity, and duration of extreme weather events. Okay, so now um, a schematic, just as we start to think about how could the statistics of, of extreme events change um, in a change in climate? So if we look at the top figure here, um, you know, think of this as, as a histogram, basically for both of these figures, on the x-axis, you know, horizontally, uh, you could have, let, you know, let's say these are temperatures, you know, really cold temperatures to the left shown in blue, really high temperatures um, to the right uh, shown with the red colors. And then the y-axis, probability of occurrence. So, you know, where I'm sitting um, in the lower Hudson Valley, you know, you might have a high probability as shown in the, in the solid gray line of temperatures, um, you know, daily mean temperatures somewhere between 48 and 60 Fahrenheit. You know, that's, that, that's you know, maybe our most common mean uh, temperatures. Not an, impossible for us to, us to get us a day where the mean temperature is below 15 Fahrenheit. Also not impossible for us to get us a day where the mean temperature is above 92 or so Fahrenheit. So even if we don't fundamentally change the nature of extreme weather events or not, the physical processes between, between, behind heat waves, just simply shifting the whole distribution, you know, this mean global warming that we've heard about of, you know, one degree or so uh, over the past century or the couple degrees that we're more or less locked into for the future. Even if the nature of individual heat waves, cold air outbreaks doesn't shift at all, just maintaining that distribution pulls all the temperatures um, you know, to the right, as you can see with, this, with the dashed line. So if we circle back to these temperatures between sort of 48 and 60 degrees, again, I'm sort of focused on the top panel here, you see from a, you know, the probability of occurrence stays about the same for those, for those days around the middle of the distribution, those really common temperatures maybe a couple percent, you know, decrease in frequency of one uh, at the lower end and a couple percent increase at the, at the higher end between, say, 48 and 60 Fahrenheit. But if we look out at those tails where we see the biggest impacts, right, um, 
a dramatic decrease in the frequency of really, really cold um, events. We had a paper this past year that looked at a southern pine beetle, like, you know, key agriculture, key, key forest pest, um, ecological pest that's highly sensitive to really cold temperatures. If you're not getting those really cold temperatures, it's one factor that helps that pest to, to thrive. And you can see small shift in average conditions gives you a large change in the frequency of really cold days. At the other end of the spectrum, we're thinking about days for New York, you know, above 95, where the max temperature is above 95 or 100. That couple degrees of warming, which doesn't sound like much, could double the frequency which would, with which we're getting, say, 100 degree days. And of course, it's not just the frequency of those days, it's the duration of the heat waves, right? We're talking about warmer nights, um, uh, longer duration to those events, and higher absolute temperatures um, during them, you know, by a couple degrees. Doesn't sound like much, but it really matters if you're talking about 104 Fahrenheit instead of 102. That implies a lot of extra demand on the electrical um, system. And we know that human populations are, are really sensitive. You know, there's a nonlinear relationship as you get out on those tails, those, those really, really hot days. So point of the top figure, small shift in average conditions loads the dice and can have a big impact um, on the frequency of these extremes that, that matter so much. But of course, not you know that, that that's sort of the first order interpretation of, of climate change you know we also though have to think about how might the actual uh, processes themselves change maybe heat waves will 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 change in some in some surprising ways maybe there'll be feedbacks between loss of soil moisture as temperatures go up that thereby makes it easier for you to get uh, more warming since so, you know more sensible heat less latent heat maybe the jet stream is going to change in the future in ways that will change how often we get the blocking high pressure systems associated with heat how long those tend to last when they occur or at the other end of the spectrum maybe they'll you know change how often we get low pressure systems you know moving through some some areas in the mid latitudes during summer which all things being equal can cool us down through cloudiness moisture um, ten, tendency to to advect air out of the north um, you know at least part of their part of their passage so the nature of extremes could change as well and that's depicted in the bottom plot here um, shown as an increase in variability um, that has a big impact out at the tails but we also need to be mindful that you know there's more uncertainty um, about how these event processes could change um, than there is about how the mean could shift. So it's, it's not always going to be an increase in variability. That's, that's going to depend um, on the variable itself. So bottom line of the top part of the figure, small shift in average conditions can mean a huge change in the frequency and intensity and duration of extremes. And then the bottom picture is this nuance of the, the events themselves uh, could change in nonlinear ways with climate change. So just to quickly think a little more about that, why might some of these processes change between, behind heat waves? Why might the statistics and the distribution change? But what we need to think about here is that it's not just the temperatures are going up, the entire planet um, is changing. Storms, for example, that form today are forming in a different environment than they were when greenhouse gas concentrations were 40% lower than they are today, you know, before the industrial revolution. We now have more water vapor in the air, which all things being equal, you know, if the, if the dynamics stay the same, give us a chance for much heavier rain events. We have warmer ocean temperatures, which again, other things being equal, you know, would tend to argue for um, stronger hurricanes, you know, at least that the strongest storms, you know, might become stronger. Um, changes in the sea ice could potentially impact the jet stream. That's an active area of research. Um, so just to sort of show out, show that, um, you know, the, the, the ingredients, the sort of baseline situation uh, is changing. Um, when any storm forms or any extreme event forms, um, it's a slightly different um, background uh, than it was in the past. So that, those are really active areas of research, how these things may all interplay um, to impact uh, extreme events um, in the future. So as, as we're now about to sort of jump into a study of trends in different types of extreme events, you know, I do want to first, um, again, just sort of acknowledge um, some of the challenges here. Some types of extreme events are really, really rare, right? If we're trying to say in a particular place um, what's going to happen to the one in a hundred year um, drought event, the event that on average happens, you know, once every hundred years, or the 
coastal flooding event that happens once every every hundred years. Um, for any one place, when events are really rare, it can be hard to characterize the true baseline variability before we even think about climate change. Um, we can think about it, the sort of noise of variability can be large relative to a climate change signal, even if a climate change signal exists. So you tend to need um, aggregation across a lot of stations and a long duration of data set for some types of climate extremes in order to see any signal, if there is one associated with greenhouse gas concentrations, amidst the natural variability of small sample sizes, essentially. Um, so um, another thing that I alluded to earlier, when we think about an extreme event, you know, it has so many drivers, it can be difficult to unpack exactly what we mean. So if you hear people say, for example, that, you know, Hurricane Sandy was so, uh, Superstorm Sandy, so devastating for the Northeast, possibly with a climate change link. What exactly are they talking about? Are they talking about the central pressure? Are they talking about um, the fact that it made this sort of left hook turn? Are they talking about how high the water levels get got, which is you know, partly a function of sea level, partly a function of the fact that it hit parts of New York City at high tide? Unpacking exactly what we mean is important. Some aspects may have stronger climate change signals. Some may be essentially um, uh, random. So that, that, that's a key element. And when we talk about an extreme event, where exactly does the meteorology end and where do we get into societal impacts and human response? Thinking about Harvey, for example, you know, their precipitation was so exceptional. Um, but where, when we look at the actual flood damage on the ground, how much is the heavy rain? How much is land use decisions uh, that have been made that you know remove the ability to capture some of that water? Clearly there's a little bit of both, there's a lot of both. Um, unpacking exactly what we mean when we talk about a flood, um, you know, how much is the meteorology, how much is climate change, it's challenging. Okay, so now let's um, jump into some uh, actual data here. Um, so I'm going to start out talking about temperature extremes. Um, so circling back, just to remind everyone in this top panel here, um, if you just shift the mean, we'd expect to see potentially pretty big changes in the frequency of record-breaking high extremes uh, increasing, record-breaking low extremes decreasing. And indeed, when we go look decade by decade across 1,800 weather stations in the U.S., showing here the ratio, record-breaking high temperatures to record-breaking low temperatures for each calendar day here. So a record-breaking high temperature can happen in January. Record-breaking low temperature can happen in July. This is just, you know, for each day. You can see a ratio close to one-to-one -to -one, um, for most of these decades. Periods actually where there were more record-breaking cold than warm. Some of that might be natural variability. Some of that might be the impact of aerosols, uh, blocked sunlight. But what you can really see here as we move towards the 2000s is with really just essentially about one degree of global warming, we'd already reached a state where you had more than twice as many record-breaking high extremes as low extremes, which is one degree or so um, of warming. And if we look year by year, um, you know, going back actually to an earlier period, you know, a few things jump out. So, so this is the ratio. Um, you know, if there's more cold uh, uh, than warm extremes, uh, you get the blue color. More warm than, than, than cold, you get the red color. So you can see, you know, there's year to year variability. Even during this last decade, there have been times over the U.S. as a whole where, you, you know, if you look at, I think that was 2014, more than twice as many record-breaking cold extremes uh, as warm. There's still some variability there even if we average across the US. Um, but a signal is clearly emerging. If we're thinking about building the infrastructure for the future, you know, protecting um, population from dangerous heat in the future, um, you can't any longer um, you know, plan for the climate extremes of the, of the past. The long, long term, if we're thinking about 10 year plans, 30 year plans, the statistics have clearly shifted. Now, a lot of what you're seeing in this plot, you know, some of it could be natural variability. I certainly don't mean to argue that this seven to one in the year 2012 is entirely a change in climate. You know, there's, there's variability embedded in here. Um, but a signal is clearly emerging. 
Um, and this is 1800 weather stations. You know, you can't, this isn't going to be just, you know, sort of local effects, you know, which could be relevant in, in, in some places associated with, with the heat island, for example. Um, this is, this is a you know, much broader phenomenon. It's also observed uh, globally to some extent. Okay, so something that we might not immediately think of as an extreme event, but, but that sort of, uh, you know, reflects an integration, if you will, of extremes, um, the increase in the length of the frost-free season, very robust trends um, across the U.S., right, essentially, um, as that mean shifts upward, um, it's harder to get, get freeze events, um, so, so, so the duration of that frost season um, going down pretty dramatically, again, just with a little bit of global warming so far, already big shifts um, in some of these metrics that are critically important um, uh, for society. Okay, let's shift away from temperature now, talk a little bit about extreme precipitation. Um, if we're looking at, you know, meet changes in annual average precipitation, most of the U.S. trends have been pretty small. In many cases, haven't emerged at the annual scale from that natural variability that we talked about uh, earlier. Um, but if we look at the really heavy rain events, which are, you know, often defined as within the rainy days, the 1% uh, rainiest uh, of those days. That's a common definition. If we look at the amount of rain falling in those heavy rain days um, across the entire country, exception of, of Hawaii, we're seeing those really heavy rain events um, either becoming more common or holding more uh, rainfall, leading to more rainfall. You can, you can define it either way uh, and get pretty similar numbers. So across the Northeast, this trend, you know, has been uh, you know, 55 percent increase over about 50 years. And again, don't focus on that exact number. There's a lot of natural variability in here, um, but that's a powerful, um, you know, powerful change. And we see it over other parts of the world as well. And of course, it's consistent with uh, our physical understanding of, uh, of, you know, why you should see heavier rain events as the atmosphere warms and can hold more. Uh, moisture. Now, another important point here to mention is that climate models have limitations, and this can cut both ways. From a risk management perspective, you know, if we really want to consider the full range of possible outcomes, which can be so important if we're, you know, thinking about fail-safe infrastructure or public safety, um, we need to be open to the idea that, you know, climate models may not capture the full range of things that can happen. And for something like heavy rain, which often, especially the sort of, you know, warm season convective, you know, local types of events, um, climate models aren't really at the right spatial resolution to capture everything that can happen there. Certainly, when we look at what happens when you run climate models over this historical period with the greenhouse gas concentrations that were present, you know, so sort of increasing as it did over the last 50 years, Climate models will show an upward trend in extreme precipitation, but they can't capture these very fast trends, um, these fast increases. So it's more likely than not that the um, climate model results would underestimate, if we relied just on models, how much heavy rain events uh, could change um, in the future. Okay, so now let's shift gears to a different type of flooding. This is a really important plot um, showing how the frequency of coastal flooding is affected by these small shifts in average sea level. We hear about, you know, seven or eight inches of global sea level rise over the last century. Sounds like nothing. How could that matter, right? Tidal cycle in a lot of places is four feet or more in many places. How could seven or eight inches of sea level really matter? Well, of course they matter because they're present all the time. It raises the baseline, it raises the floor, uh, making it much more easy to get um, high water levels of a certain height. You know, the cliche I always use is sea level raises the floor of the basketball court. Um, you know, and if a slam dunk um, is, you know, at 10 feet on that rim, there aren't that many people who can slam dunk at 10 feet. But if you raise that floor just eight inches or so, it's not just a little bit more people who can dunk, um, it's a lot more. Um, so you dramatically change the frequency of coastal flooding with a small shift in that baseline. So looking again, focusing on the historical part here, not projections, for two cities along the coast with long-term tide gauges, Charleston, San Francisco, very different environments, you can see that this nuisance flooding, the kind of thing that happens maybe a few times per year um, at the baseline sea levels 50 years ago, um, a nuisance when it happens, hard for some people who live right along the coast to you know, get home from work, a little bit of water maybe in a few people's basements, in some people's basements. Um, 
not necessarily a life changer if it's only happening a few times a year, but you can see already that yellow line that for many of these places, especially Charleston, already having maybe something on the order of 30 or more um, of these events per year, as opposed to a sixth that amount perhaps 40 or 50 years ago, um, you know, with just with those small amounts of sea level rise. Charleston's actually had a little more sea level rise than seven or eight inches, but that's that's not central to this story. You can, you can see the same patterns in, in San Francisco. And we're not going to talk a lot about projections, but you can see um, you don't have to go to extreme sea level rise scenarios. The historical trend continuing in sea level um, really gives you a transformative uh, risk in terms of how often these events happen in the future. That's the nuisance flooding. What about the biggies? Um, what about the more catastrophic uh, flood events. So here now, let's focus, um, I just got time to quickly look at each of these. On the left, um, for tide gauges along the U.S., what's the amount of high water? How big is the surge essentially associated with that one in a hundred, um, one, one in a hundred year event? So as you'd expect, parts of the Gulf Coast jump right out at you, right? No surprises there. Every hundred years, we estimate Clearly, there's uncertainties in these estimates. Um, we don't have that long a record, but on the order of 12 to 15 feet might be a one in a hundred year surge. Other parts of the coast, San Francisco, where you don't get huge, uh, certainly don't get tropical cyclones uh, very often, if ever. The surges there might be more on the order of three to six feet. Now let's look at the right. Uh, the right is showing you with two feet of sea level rise, which is a conservative estimate. We'll be lucky if we only get two feet of sea level rise by two generations from now, for example, by, or by 2100. But even if we only get two feet of sea level rise, and even if the nature of storms doesn't change at all, we're not invoking stronger hurricanes, we're not invoking changes in nor'easters, just the storms of the past, that two feet of sea level rise presents a transformative change in frequency, right? So Anywhere you see red there in the figure on the right, that's places that historically had that high water level once every 100 years. They're going to be experiencing it roughly once every year with just two feet of sea level rise and no change in storms. That's what raising that baseline, raising that floor does. You don't need stronger storms uh, to get that catastrophic um, uh, uh, flooding. And you see that all along the coast, even in the places that are relatively better off, you know, those light greens even you know one turquoise in there things that used to happen once every hundred years in terms of high water levels from storm storm surge and, and sea level rise happening within the lifetime of the typical mortgage um, so this is you know we're locked into this two feet of sea level rise um, this is a you know a fundamental um, challenge going forward no matter what happens to storms themselves and that sea level rise doesn't just mean more frequent coastal flooding. What you're seeing here in these colors is how for a given event, for a given storm, if you will, raising that sea level means additional areas uh, getting flooded that didn't in the past, depicted, for example, in yellow and red um, for, for, for New York City. Okay, I want to keep us moving. I'm mindful of, of time here. Let's quickly talk a little bit um, about some other types of, of extreme events. Certainly everyone wants to know what's going to happen to uh, tropical cyclones. I think this is one of the more nuanced pictures. Um, there's you know, some things that we know uh, more or less for sure. As I just said, sea level rise is going to increase the frequency and extent of, of flooding with coastal storms. We're also confident that as the atmosphere warms, for a given hurricane of a given strength, there's going to be more precipitation um, associated with it. Some studies have suggested, you know, maybe 10% increase um, in, in precipitation per degree um, Celsius of warming. Um, but, but, you know, that'll also uh, increase the risk. I think it's also certainly fair to say that the balance of evidence suggests that the major hurricanes, the category three, four, and five, become more frequent and more intense um, as the planet warms, largely because of their sensitivity to sea surface temperatures and the upper ocean uh, temperatures, which we have high confidence are gonna, gonna, gonna increase with climate change. Nevertheless, you know, I think that this is a case where we can't quite call this one um, a sure thing. And certainly if we're talking about tropical cyclones as a whole, um, tropical depressions, um, those storms that don't quite get to hurricane status, Balance of evidence, you know, probably suggests maybe the, the amounts stay about the same. I think we can't rule out the idea that there, there could be could be fewer um, of those events. 
And even though the balance of evidence suggests more of the strong, powerful hurricanes, um, you know, probably can't rule out the idea that, uh, that, that that could be wrong, given that upper ocean is only one of the key drivers, right? We also got to be thinking about things like aerosols in the air, dust in the air, um, temperature of the upper atmosphere, amount of moisture in the atmosphere, what's going to happen to the sort of initial pulses, these uh, low pressure systems coming off the African coast, for example, that are key to our sort of Atlantic hurricanes. So this is a good example of a place where there's, you know, you know more nuance, even as from a risk management perspective, it probably makes sense, almost certainly makes sense to, 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 to think that the strong hurricanes um, will become, become more common. Tornadoes, way outside my area of expertise. It's a given that a lot of you on this call could, could tell me much more about this than I can. That's probably true for a lot of the things I've talked about. Certainly it's true for, for tornadoes. I tried to keep up a little bit um, with this literature. I would you know, sort of tend to argue that you know, the first order um, statement would probably be if we look at the historical trends, um, you know, no clear and compelling evidence um, um, probably that the uh, days per year with at least one tornado is changing in a meaningful way with climate change. Although, you know, some evidence, um, you know, I'm sure we could talk about data sources, how easy it is to track um, tornadoes and how that's changed, could be responsible for some of this uh, upward trend we're seeing in um, uh, days per year with more than, than 30, these, these sort of cluster events. Again, this is way outside my area of expertise, but I wanted to put it up there because um, I'm, sure, I'm sure it'll be of interest to, to many of you. Um, how about wildfires? Uh, here, you know, we can, you know, again, look at multiple metrics, the number of fires, um, you know, where, you know, it'd be hard to make any case that there's been an upward trend, but there is, you know, strong evidence that we're seeing more of these really big fires burning more and more um, acres. I think unpack, this is another good example of unpacking how much of this is climate change, how much of it is higher temperatures um, leading to moisture deficits, plants drying out, uh, trees drying out, um, you know, certainly higher temperatures make it much easier for that to happen. That's part of the story. Um, it's probably easier to settle that piece than the interannual precipitation, um, you know, where natural variability still tends to dominate um, in most of these places um, uh, relative to a climate change signal. There may also be a component here to what's referred to as wooey, right? People moving into the um, the wildfire urban uh, interface, um, uh, potentially starting more fires. Um, that may be, be, be part of the story as well, as well as more generally changes in land use, uh, you know, forest management practices, part of the story as well. But it's reasonable to say from a physical sense, you know, we know temperatures have been going up um, and we know that all things being equal, that can give you um, a lot more fire damage. That's part of the story. Just how much I think is difficult to unpack. Okay, I'm almost done. I had a few more slides I want to show. You know, I've intentionally focused on um, historical trends, you know, but now I want to spend a little time sort of thinking about where we go um, from here. So a little context, we've had about a 40% increase in the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere directly due uh, to human activity, land use changes, and especially the burning of, of fossil fuels. Had about one degree, a um, little less than one degree Celsius of warming globally uh, during that time. If we want to avoid seeing that some of these extreme event trends accelerating, um, we need to dramatically reduce um, our emissions. The further we push carbon dioxide concentrations away from where they were um, pre industrially, they had been about 280 parts per million, now they're over 400. Even if we reduce our emissions a little bit, as long as those concentrations keep going up, we're further from the equilibrium of 280, which means an acceleration of the types of changes that we've been talking about. To actually turn that around, we need to reduce emissions um, to such a dramatic extent that the concentrations actually start to fall. Um, so this is a major challenge requiring huge changes um, and everything from our energy usage to you know, any number of, uh, of aspects of, of our lifestyles. If we wanna have a good chance of limiting ourselves to just two degrees Celsius of warming, keeping in mind that you know, carbon stays in the atmosphere uh, a long time, so we're already locked into some more warming no matter what we do, um, to have even just a 50-50 chance of not blowing through two degrees of total warming, and again, we've, almost, we've already had almost one degree, 
we really have only about now less than 25 years. This figure is a few years old, not the 27.8 that you see there in, in, in medium color purple. We have less than 25 years where we could emit globally greenhouse gases at the level we've been emitting them in recent years. At that point, we'd have to immediately go to year zero the next year, which of course, um, you know, given our reliance, given that we don't have substitutes currently for, for things like aviation fuel is just one example. Um, you know, you see the, see the scope, scope of the challenge and the urgent need to, to dramatically reduce um, emissions. Or what, right? Let's, let's, let's talk a little bit about the future here. Um, and I'll just tell you about, sort of end with some of the things that, that I've been thinking about these days. Um, so first, some hot topics I didn't really have a chance to, to get into. A lot of people talking these days, I'm sure you are too, many of you, about compound extreme events. Can't just think about one variable. How are they interacting? Um, is there correlation in space um, between some extremes? If multiple bread baskets around the world get extreme heat and drought um, during the growing season, what that might that mean for global food security? If Boston gets sequences of nor'easters one after the other more often in the future, how does that modify uh, vulnerability and risk relative to thinking about events individually? Or what if you have a heat wave right after um, a tropical storm knocks power out? Um, compound extremes, critical to risk assessment. I've talked a little bit about tail risks. What might climate models miss at either end of the spectrum? Critically important if we're thinking about things like nuclear reactors, um, nuclear plants that may be near sea level, um, you know, uh, you know, critical infrastructure um, of, of high value as, as a couple examples. A lot of people talking about detection and attribution of extreme events now. As we can attribute part, the frequency of some of these events or a portion of, uh, of what happens in the events, a portion of the rainfall, for example, to this increase in greenhouse gases, um, that potentially opens up some interesting doors in terms of risk communication. Some people even beginning to argue that um, sort of liability conversations about sort of responsibility for fossil fuel emissions to date could be brought up more and more in the context of uh, human contributions to damages associated with extreme events, such as Sandy, to name just one. And what are the global dimensions of extremes? We've talked a lot about the U.S., but how are we all affected? Um, you know, by changes in other places too in extreme events. An example of a compound, wet bulb, this, this combination of heat plus humidity. Showing on the um, uh, left here, this is climate model results um, for, you know, where you expect to see the highest wet bulbs, you know, the, the highest wet bulb day, that link of high temperature and humidity in the historical period shown on the left. So you see the higher values sort of trending towards yellow um, in, in some parts of the tropics, but not exclusively the tropics. You can see some fairly high values over parts of the uh, eastern U.S. Then let's go to the right and say, for whatever that wet bulb temperature, that combination of temperature and humidity that used to happen once per, that historically happened once per year, say it's a wet bulb of 30, um, you know, as we go to the future, mid-century, um, this is a scenario where we emit a lot of greenhouse gases. How many days per year is that particular threshold of temperature and humidity, that high threshold going to be caught, crossed in the future? You can see again how profoundly that frequency changes um, just within a generation um, or two if we continue to you know, emit a lot of greenhouse gases for parts of the U.S., essentially two months per year, 60 days um, or more. Um, you know, where you're having that extreme threshold that historically has only happened once per year. Um, again, as with all this, don't focus on these precise numbers. These are climate model um, outputs. Different things are going to be happening to some extent at local spatial scales. Um, but the point here is that we're talking about, you know, more than an order of magnitude um, change associated with just a relatively small amount um, of warming. So this is, I think, a, a risk that's been understated. And to really understand it, we need to think about temperature and humidity and how they interact together, which has such a big impact on our ability to cool ourselves. Okay, um, tail risks, um, things that climate models may not capture well. The, you know, the iconic example certainly um, is sea level rise. You know, we, we've uh, understood now that um, some of the many ways that an ice sheet um, uh, can melt, that ice that sits on land, 
Uh, a lot of it happens at really fine scales that climate models aren't able to capture that well. Um, and we're becoming more and more concerned as those greenhouse gas concentrations go higher and higher, that we may be unleashing you know, fundamental changes, um, accelerating processes that even if we were to lower greenhouse gas concentrations might prove hard to stop. You know, we don't know where those tipping points sit, hence the urgent need to, to you know, reduce our emissions so we, so we don't go outside of, further outside of that envelope um, of what we've experienced, you know, and so that we don't sort of open the door to these sort of Frankenstein uh, solutions, such as sea level rise, you know, far in excess of, of two feet by 2100. We're not meaning to suggest here at all that we're going to get eight feet of sea level rise by 2100. This is the idea that from a risk management perspective, um, we can no longer rule out as a plausible worst case scenario that we could see eight feet of sea level rise. So you saw how much the frequency of coastal flooding change, without storms changing at all changes with two feet of sea level rise. So you can, you can imagine what eight feet means. Um, we can't just think about this coastal flood risk, you know, locally in our backyards. Um, what does it mean for the country? What does it mean for the world? The idea of single points of failure, you know, if so much of our um, understanding of space and our key, informa our key information about the earth um, is relying on uh, launch pads such as at Kennedy that are, you know, vulnerable to storm surge today, so close to the coast, what would it mean for our nation um, if we lost that launch uh, capacity? I put an S here, point, single points of failure since, you know, you know, recognizing that Kennedy's not quite the only game in town, but it's, but it's pretty close. Um, vulnerable communities outside of the U.S., what's our responsibility when we think about sea level rise to, to people living in parts of the world where there's very little adaptive capacity, very little sort of institutional uh, support for the effects of sea level rise? Iconic threats posed to small island nations, the very sort of notion of, of statehood, identity, um, you know, challenged with, uh, you know, with, with, with sea level rise. You know, where, how do you adapt in a place like this? You, know, you start getting into questions of, of migration and, um, you know, national identity and sort of existential threats. And then, you know, parts of the world where literally hundreds of millions of people um, are potentially uh, exposed to the effects of, of sea level. What does that mean for their agriculture? What does it mean for their immediate vulnerability to, to storm surge, their ability to evacuate? Um, what does it mean uh, for these ecosystems? And where do these people go? You know, what's, um, you know, what's the, the sort of ethical um, dimensions, but also geopolitical um, uh, dimensions to, to this? Clearly, you know, uh, retreat and migration are going to be um, inevitably more, more part of this conversation uh, as sea levels rise with, with global implications. Um, key points wrapping up. Um, I hope I've uh, you know, made a compelling case that already with just small shifts in average temperature and sea level associated with human activities, we've seen big changes in the statistics of many types of extreme events, extreme heat, extreme cold, heavy rain events, frequency of coastal flooding. Um, that's in the historical trends, not even going to the future. As long as greenhouse gas concentrations rise, we expect those rates of change um, to accelerate um, as well. We expect to see bigger, you know, additional increases in, the, in those statistics um, or decreases for things like cold that are going down. Um, further, we push the system, the greater the potential for surprises. I showed the ice sheets and sea level rise. Um, the further we push the system, the bigger the chance it's gonna be something we can't even, um, you know, fathom now. How could heat waves change in the future? What might, Loss of the ice pack, the sea ice that sits over the poles. If that goes away with higher greenhouse gas concentrations, what might that mean for the jet stream? I don't have the answer for you. To be honest, nobody does. But from a risk management perspective, further we push that system, the less we can count on all of our sort of assumptions about how things work that guide everything we do, that guide our meteorology, um, you know, as one example, you know, may not hold up to the same extent um, in, in, in the future. So this, of course, um, you know, is, the, is, you know, the basis of this argument for why we need to reduce our emissions so dramatically and why adaptation and resilience um, are, are, are so critical. Maybe we can get tipping points and surprises on that side to, to really help us out. We've seen how quickly the cost of renewables, uh, solar and wind uh, generation are dropping. We see advances in um, battery storage technology, um, electrics. We you know we're not that far away potentially from some from some tipping points in terms of the economics working in the favor of renewables, 
Um, and on the adaptation side, maybe some surprises too, you know, just to give one example, you know, hearing more and more about companies like Moody's, um, you know, that are, that are sort of critical to underwriting um, bonds for, for municipalities and, and, and other groups demanding really that, um, you know, climate hazards of the type we're describing here today be considered in the planning um, um, as people look to the future. If they don't consider how these things may change, and if they don't, you know, plan for extreme events, uh, could impact credit rating um, uh, as just one example. You know, once those starts, types of things start to happen, once investors are demanding uh, that companies um, disclose their emissions, but also their vulnerabilities to some of these changes, um, you can make the case that things might change, uh, might change really fast. So that's a, that's another important tipping point to, to, to think about when we try to think about where we're going, uh, in the future. Final slide, uh, other future research activities. How can we evaluate some of these adaptation strategies underway? Green infrastructure, storm surge barriers in the context of rare extremes. Uh, can we stress test some of these adaptations before the next Sandy or Harvey happens? How do you do that? Is that a role for scientists? Is that engineers? Is it all aspects of society? Um, how do we do risk assessment that's not just climate models, that looks at the historical data, that looks at physical processes, that looks at expert judgment? Um, that's how we can do our long-term planning and stakeholder scientist collaborations, um, collaborations with, with you all across all of society, I think are gonna, gonna be key to, that, uh, to those kind of processes. So I'll end there, thank you. Riley, thank you very much. We appreciate all that good information. It is a lot to take in, no question. Uh, I'm going to leave control of, this, of, the, uh, of the presentation with you for a minute as we attack a couple of questions here real briefly. If there's something else you want to want to pop up uh, while we do this. Uh, one of the questions I had real briefly was, is there any good way, I mean, this is not an easy question at all, but how to unpack some of those things you talked about earlier uh, in terms of society versus meteorological impacts vis-a-vis -vis flooding, uh, yeah. freshwater flooding. I mean, I think it's kind of clear that the sea level rise and coastal flooding is is, is probably, you're melting ice, you're flooding. That, that's pretty standard. But when we look at things like the Harvey, uh, how easy, how difficult is it to tease out those kinds of, th those environmental factors uh, that in a built environment versus uh, the meteorological aspects? I think it's really difficult. I mean, in the ideal world, we'd have, you know, a hundred or more years of historical data, you know, at the hourly, um, you know, resolution, you know, with a whole bunch of grit, you know, sensors, um, you know, you know, in the, in the Gulf area, for example. Of course, in the real world, we don't have that rich station by station detail going back a hundred years, certainly not uh, hourly. So we're never going to know exactly, you know, before climate change, precisely what was the one in a hundred year hourly rain event, one in a hundred year, you know, three day rain event. Um, but, you know, we do know um, there are things we can do, right? We can run models over a historical period with the greenhouse gas concentrations of what they were back then, compare how much either rainfall you get um, in those simulations or something else that we associate um, uh, you know, with, with rainfall, the amount of moisture in the air, if you compare that to a climate model run for the present greenhouse gas concentrations. Does the model suggest that you should get more um, heavy rain event? That would be a good um, uh, data point. Um, I think to get to your question, you know, we need, you know, the input of hydrologists uh, for sure. That would be one, you know, obvious, obvious dimension. Land use changes, um, you know, engineering. I think that's, you know, a grand challenge. And, um, you know, we're probably never going to get, you know, down to, you know, a few percent precision in terms of, of, of responsibility. But, you know, there's, you know, I think clearly there's, there, clearly there's a role um, in the climate. We can also learn things by, by leveraging other places, right? We can, you know, to some extent, we can treat the entire Gulf Coast, for example, as a region, a region that differs, but, you know, there's some additional power we can gain from aggregating storms across, across larger areas. I'm sorry, I don't have a better answer to your question. I think it's, a, you know, a really important and really challenging one that points to the need to engage all of society um, in, these, in these questions.
Yeah, I mean, it is a difficult one to be sure. Uh, yeah, we go back and you you run these hindcast models in, in these different scenarios to try to get some some idea. So it is certainly uh, not an easy proverbial nut to crack. Uh, we did get one other uh, question in uh, regarding ice storms. Um, of course, next to hurricanes and tropical systems, uh, that's big, big damage to electrical utilities. Uh, in a warming climate, has there been anything looking at the increasing frequency of, of ice storms? This is another one that I don't know much about, um, but I'll, I'll try to summarize, you know, my, you know, sort of limited knowledge on this. Um, and maybe there's a way offline that others with, with more expertise can, can sort of fill in the discussion. You know, my overall understanding is that, you know, ice storms again fall in this category of, you know, rare events where the natural variability can be really large relative to um, any trend. I haven't seen studies suggesting a strong anthrop anthropogenic human trend um, in ice storms. That's kind of the extent of my knowledge. I'll just point out though, from a process perspective, you know, one might be tempted, you know, sort of initially to think, oh, you know, warming temperatures might give you less, you know, instances when you could have ice. But of course that would be, you know, you know, way too simplistic, you know, just by having fewer freezes, but that's of course way too simplistic, right? You know, we have to think about temperature profiles um, in the atmosphere, the amount of moisture in the atmosphere. I don't think that sort of, you know, overall, you know, an individual uh, sort of explanation of the physics alone could, could, could answer this one, although those with more expertise could probably, you know, do a better job than I did. But I think, um, you know, this is one where the uncertainties are high, and I at least, um, you know, haven't seen a, a study over the U.S. as a whole that, that showed a long-term trend one way, or the, one way or the other in the context of this huge, you know, really big year-to-year -year variability. All right, uh, Riley, we're almost out of time. As I mentioned, Bernadette's here beside me. I know she had something she wanted to, to chime in as well. Bern, please go ahead. Bradley, thank you so much. This was fantastic. And I loved, in particular, your sort of foresight, bringing up the hard questions that we don't necessarily have answers to yet, but really are the areas of research that we need to focus on. And with that being the case, I'm kind of curious, just from your perspective, what's the most exciting area of research as it pertains to extreme weather right now that you're either a part of or that you are following? Yeah, that's uh, that's a great question. I would say that I'm, you know, I'm very, I'm very interested in the in um, this general topic of the compound extreme events. I would say um, so. Historically, maybe we looked place by place, event by event, um, and said, you know, how might each place be affected by a particular heat wave? Um, now, taking this approach instead of you know, could we see a greater risk of simultaneous heat waves in multiple places or longer duration heat waves? If we think about the spatio-temporal characteristics of extremes and how those could change, for example, if the jet stream changes, um, you know, if we see less steering um, sort of west to east in the middle latitudes in the future. A big if, but I think, you know, from a risk perspective, something that's distinctly possible. Um, what might that mean? It could point to some, you know, nonlinear surprises in terms of the ability of our food systems to respond, um, you know, as, as, just, as just one example. So speculative to some extent, but I think, um, you know, critically important from a risk perspective. Thanks. That's really helpful. And I know that that's a topic that's been brought up with the National Climate Assessments and in general, too, in addition, how that reflects on our response system. And we saw that being stressed with the hurricane season that we just went through already and how these compound events could make that even worse. So thank Absolutely. you very much. I appreciate Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Thank you. All right, uh, Bradley, thanks again so much for spending time with us this afternoon. I uh, appreciate you uh, making, the, making the effort to spend some time with us today. Uh, we thanks, also, everybody. You bet. You bet. Absolutely. Also, for those of you still on the line, be on the lookout for our next two Climate Matters releases. Tomorrow, we examine droughts and deluges. Examining percent of normal precipitation so far in 2018 for 244 cities across the country. And then the following week, we'll have a new analysis on Atlantic hurricanes just a couple of days before the next Atlantic hurricane season. And right before we go, save the date. Next month, we have a very special Spanish language webinar with Henry Bersinio from Florida International University. This is in conjunction 
with the National Association of Hispanic Journalists and head of the NAHJ International Training Conference in Miami this July. This will be aimed at journalists, so please take some time and share this with your colleagues. Again, for Bernadette and all of us here uh, at Climate Central, I want to thank you for joining us. Bernadette, anything else? No, that's about it. Thank you, everybody. We appreciate it. Thank you so much for uh, making this so successful, and uh, enjoy the rest of your week. Goodbye, everybody.